So we'll just the last few minutes of the afternoon, I'll give you a brief introduction to the HPX library, which has been mentioned a couple of times over the last two days. And it uses a lot of the techniques that have been shown to you during the last few days. And I'm not going to focus very much on the API, but more of what HPX, HPX is and what it can do for you um, in the context of HPC. And so really, it should be like an hour long talk or longer. But I'll just give you a two minute introduction. Um, We've talked about standard threads and about OpenMP and about things like that. And if you start using standard threads and you create threads to do bits of work and you try and use those threads to compute something and then collect the results from those threads, you'll find that it's remarkably difficult to make your code consistent and race-free and to work the way you want. And also there's a cost overhead with creating and destroying threads if you create thousands and thousands of standard threads, you can effectively bring your machine to a halt because the operating system is trying to give time slices to those threads and it can cause problems. But all of our processors are, are multi-core now, so we really need to use all those threads. And OpenMP is one very valid way of doing it. HPX provides a slightly different approach by giving you lightweight threads. So you have n cores on your machine, so you want n threads on your machine, and then the bits of work that you give to those threads, we think of as tasks. And I'm going to use the word thread a lot during the next 15 minutes, but I'll try, whenever you hear the word thread, try to think to yourself task rather than thread. Um, and what HPX is trying to do is to allow you to use those lightweight threads as if they were real threads and do it as efficiently and coordinate the work for you to take some of the burden of the programming off you. Um, the API basically mirrors the standard library, so everything you can do with a standard thread you can pretty much do with an HPX thread, but think task. And the HPX library adds a whole bunch of features, mostly mirroring the proposals for C++ in the future, so C++ 17 and beyond. The proposals that are going in are being implemented in HPX as a kind of testing ground for that. And to a certain extent, where things are working and where things are not working, those, the, those lessons are being learned, are being used to help refine some of those proposals. Um, the really main things that you find in HPX are the composability and the continuations so that you can do things with threads after they complete and how to make sure that you don't block and waste time. And ideally you would be able to replace all of your OpenMP and MPI code with HPX in, in an ideal world because everything you can do in OpenMP you can do in HPX and HPX extends the API so that you can spawn tasks on remote nodes in a very similar way to you would spawn them locally. But I won't have time to go into that today, so I'll focus mostly on just local, um, local operation. The really main difference from my point of view from OpenMP and HPX is the way in OpenMP you have a pragma OpenMP parallel loop, and at the end of that loop, you can say no wait, but there's a, there's a barrier effectively, and you can't, you can't create a function which returns a task from an OpenMP and then pass that function somewhere else and add it to a list of other tasks and then wait on that group of tasks. So you, can't, you can't build things up at runtime in the way you can with, a, with, a, um, with, a, with, a, with HPX. And this really sums it up. On the left, that's what you want, and on the right is what you actually get if you try and write threaded programs, and I've done a lot of it, and I, and I can testify that the one on the right is pretty much what it ends up like. And when you discuss lightweight threads, the, the thing it takes a long time to really focus and understand on how the runtime is operating, and OpenMP basically does the same as this, is you've got a bunch of cores on your machine, and they may be on different sockets, uh, you'll have N cores on a socket, and on each core, you get an operating system thread. When you start your program, the runtime, OpenMP, when you start an OpenMP road and runtime, it builds a thread pool. When you start HPX, it builds a thread pool. And what you get is effectively a queue of work for each core that you're operating on. And one of those, one of those operating system threads becomes 
where your work is going to execute and you keep those operating system threads alive for the duration of your program and you don't create and destroy them, create and destroy them. And this is where you effectively save time because creating and destroying an operating system level thread is quite an expensive operation because of thread local storage because of context switching in the processor. But when you create and destroy HPX threads, all you're doing is effectively swapping function pointers to bits of code they're executing with a little bit of memory that's used for the stack for those being swapped in and out. And the, the threads aren't explicitly suspended by the HPX runtime. You can wait for things and you can yield to things, uh, or I shouldn't have said that actually, not so much yield, but the operating system might suspend your code in the background, but HPX isn't preemptively suspending this thread and then running that one and suspending this one and running that one. It's just running them as they come and when they finish, it puts the next one on. And so when you create a task, when you've got a bit of work that you want to do, you have to say how you want it to be executed. And so when you spawn something with this async syntax, or there's also HPX parallel, and then the standard library provides algorithms for find and copy and do this and scan and partial sum. When you do an HPX parallel algorithm with one of these in, effectively you have to say to it where and how to run those tasks. And executors are the way this is done, so that you can you can supply in a similar way to the tag types that are given to those things we just saw a minute ago. You can effectively say, when you run this task, here's some hints on how I want it run. Do I want it run sequentially or in parallel? Do I want it run on a specific core? And if you do, you can, for example, customize the executors. And if you want to reserve a core somewhere or reserve a NUMA domain and run dedicated tasks on that one, you can create a custom executor to do that and there's a whole lot of work going into HPX to allow you to do that kind of thing, which I won't go into any details, but this facility exists. And the idea is to try and create an API that you and I can use so that it becomes fairly straightforward to implement concurrent programming, parallelism, distributed computing as well, so that you can spawn tasks somewhere else with the same API and framework, and to make it all fairly straightforward within the C++ framework we're, we're familiar with. Um, the, yeah? Well, the, the work on distributed is ongoing, and I wouldn't say that it's production ready. It works, but if you were to do a parallel sort, the way you can write your algorithm to do a parallel sort on a single node with effectively shared memory, you would write the algorithm differently if you were doing it distributed on a cluster because the first part of the sort algorithm is finding a pivot and you might be searching at both ends of the arrays to, for a different point to which to split the array. And if you were doing that in distributed, you'd suddenly be hit by the costs of sending and receiving things across the network. And so, Ideally, there'll be HPX parallel and a list of algorithms, and there'll be like HPX distributed and a list of algorithms or something like that. But the actual implementations will be subtly different. But hopefully, the API will look pretty much the same, so you can just do a search and replace on certain keywords to get that effect. But I don't have time in the 15 minutes to talk about distributed, so I put it in brackets because I want, to, I want you to know it exists, but I don't want to try and tell you about it in too much detail. Um, so think tasks rather than threads. And there are, you want to try and have the same framework able to handle simple async futures, to be able to handle parallel algorithms, and also the traditional fork join semantics that you get with something like OpenMP. And the way futures are extended in HPX is really with the then keyword. So that you can say, here's a future, Oh, sorry, here's a, here's a task, run it, when, give me a future to it, and when that, compute, when that future is ready, when that task is finished, then do this. And the nice thing about that is that when you say get here, when you call get on your future, you're not waiting for that, because this then only gets scheduled to run when the future is ready already, so there's no wait applied here. So you're not waiting for the future, and you're not putting your task into a suspended state. And there seems to be a slide missing, but... John, uh, just want to say, the dot then 
uh, is actually being proposed for, the st for, for standardization, and it, it is in a part of the fundamental TS. So yes. it's actually, there should be also an implementation like in a, somewhere, and, uh, and, and which is not HPX, it's just uh, like experimental something. And, and hopefully all of the things that I show you today will at some point go into the standard. I, I, I think that all of the whens and the thens and the... I don't know what else I've put on my slides because I can't remember, but all the things that are in these slides, at some point they should hopefully go into the standard. And the reason why I want to stress how important the get is, is because this is a, a vampire output from an algorithm where you can see there are eight OpenMP tasks and they effectively sit there waiting whilst the other thread, there's actually a main application thread and then eight OpenMP threads in this particular example. In, in reality, you probably wouldn't have a separate thread for the application, but that's just the way this one's set up. And that thread there is doing something, and all those OpenMP tasks are waiting. And what you want to do is you want to make sure that you minimize all the waits so that, uh, oops, so that, um, so that, so that all those other cores as soon as one thread goes into a wait because it can't do any more work, something else gets brought in from somewhere else. And you want to keep, you want to keep as many small tasks waiting in the queues and minimize the dependencies between them so that you don't have to wait for stuff. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but all this template instantiation that has been discussed over the last few days. When you spawn a task using async, there's a number of different specializations in the HPX library which effectively do different things. So you can spawn one and say, execute this function with these parameters and give me a future back. And the future is, of course, templated on whether it's an int or a void or whether it's a, some structure that you're returning. And you can also spawn them remotely with an action type, where an action type is something on another node. And it's this type deduction which effectively allows it to choose the different specialization. The, if you, uh, so the, I, I'm getting muddled up here. The locality ID, the second one here, gives you the, the, remote, the remote ID that you want to spawn something on. Down here, we have different launch policies so that you can say launch Synchronously, meaning on the same thread that this current call is on. Asynchrony, meaning spawn it on a different one. I should say a different HPX thread, not operating system thread. Uh, this comes into play, for example, when, when you say, when this, when this task completes, then do this. Now, if you know that when that task completes and then you're going to do this, you might as well spawn this on the same thread that that task just completed on because there's no point creating a new one for it. So then you'd want to use this launch sync but there are other times when you specifically want to say launch it asynchronously on a completely different thread for whatever reason. And all of these are, uh, are um, provided for in the API. The other really nice feature is the composability so that you can, you can say do this and do this and when they've both completed then do this. And you can create a new future from two other futures. So you can say, this future is doing some task, this future is doing some task, combine those into one new future, and then you can apply a when all for those two. And there's actually a whole bunch of semantics around the when and the when all, so that you can, you can do much more complex combinations here. So you can say, I've got a vector of futures, push back and notice that futures are movable but not copyable unless it's a shared future. So this is actually a move onto the vector. And you say asynchronously do this, and when that completes, then do that, and when that completes, then do this, and that final then, because this first async produces a future, which dot then produces a second future, which dot then produces a third future, and only that final future then goes pushed into your vector. And then later on you can say, when all of this vector of futures, then do something. And what this means is that you can just fire off tons and tons and tons of bits of work and you can effectively build a DAG up by saying, when that one completes, do this, push it onto the vector. When that one completes, do this, push it onto the vector. When that one completes, do, do this. And you can compose a whole structure of futures with complex interdependencies and then wrap them all up into another bunch of futures and then wait on that. So you can build up trees of futures and recursively you can... You can walk through a tree saying, do the left, do the right. I've got some examples in a moment of that. Uh, I showed you that slide already. 
Um, in, f in fact, this, this is the point where if you did what we're just doing, you generated vectors of futures and you fired them all off and they go into the queues, and then one operation is taking a long time, and a whole bunch of other vector, a whole, whole bunch of other futures. Let's suppose in this case that there are eight other futures which depend on that top one. They all go into effectively a waiting queue. They can't run until the first one is completed. Now, if you've only got eight futures in your system, that's it. You just have to wait for the first one. If you've got 800 in the system and there's 790 odd other futures waiting for different things, some of those are going to come ready and they will fill this gap up here. So I can't take your algorithm, which adds three numbers together, and make it run faster on an HPX thread, because it will run exactly the same speed as on an operating systems thread, or a P thread, or a standard thread, because it's the same processor doing it. But what I can do is I can schedule everything so that you can just create thousands of these threads, and then any time any thread is effectively waiting for something and the processor becomes idle, it says, okay, no problem, I've got more work to do. So the mission is to break your algorithm into as many interdependent and wherever possible independent tasks so that they can all just go into the work queues and you can say, do this one, it doesn't depend on that. This one does depend on that, but that one doesn't, so do this one. And you can just keep pulling them off the queue. And so the scheduler is going to introduce a little bit of an overhead. But if you can get 90% of n cores instead of 30% of n cores, you're still winning because you don't want to have these big wait states when all the cores are effectively doing nothing. There's an extra, an extra nicety that's been added, which is referred to as data flow, which effectively is, is a when all then. So instead of saying when all of these futures complete, then do that, you can effectively just say data flow that, and you know inside data flow that all of these futures here that you're calling get on, they've already completed because this doesn't effectively get, doesn't get um, scheduled to run until the left and the right. So as you, if in this case, descending a tree, you've got the left node and the right node. You say, when the left and the right are completed, then do this you know that this isn't completed until they've, that this is called, until they're completed. So each recursive step down in the tree spawns new tasks. And when each of the leaf nodes completes on that, then that node can run. And when those two nodes complete, then this node can run. And when these two nodes complete, these can run. So you're building a DAG. And the compiler is basically doing all the work for you. And the scheduler is then doing all the actual management for you. Uh, John, can, uh, I'm a little lost here. So that is a lambda capturing n and f. So n is the node, and f is a function you want to apply. You visit left and right, and then data flow on, the, uh, on those futures L and R. And L and R, what are L and R? Uh, left and right? You, you've got a left, I, oh, I no, don't know no, the okay, pointer. The, you've got a left, okay, right. a left future and a right future, and then you just uh, basically it's saying is, when both of those are ready, move left yeah. and right into and this lambda and call get on them, which doesn't wait because they've already it's completed. Already okay. Because that yeah. one's sitting in the queue. In the, effectively, the scheduler maintains a number of queues. The first queue is, these ones are ready, you can just run them. The, all the dependencies are ready, so anything they need. The next is a sort of queue which has dependencies, and when a future, you see, the compiler knows, effectively, that when you created this future, it depends on those. So when it's inserted in the queue, it has these two dependencies. And when those become ready, they effectively unlock the futures that, that, that are waiting on them. So they then move into the ready queue. And there was a question. If you have uh, that kind of recursive algorithm, then like, uh, yesterday we discussed that if we spawn OS threads, then uh, this is like too much overhead. So with recursive algorithms using HPC tasks, are those tasks in a kind of thread pool? They are uh, determined the number of uh, tasks are static, or you generate those tasks in the runtime? The, 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 the thread or the task in HPX is a much smaller unit than a standard thread. It doesn't involve a context switch on the operating system level. 
and it doesn't have thread local storage. It doesn't have a lot of the semantics of an actual thread. It's really just a function. You can imagine that the, the real thread, the operating system thread, is just spinning, saying, doing work, doing, doing, doing. When it completes, it's executing a function. When it finishes executing a function, that thread, that, that future that represents, that function is a future, effectively. It becomes ready, and it goes, it tells the scheduler that, fu that future is ready, and then it pulls the next piece of work off. So this lambda, it's basically just a function pointer with a couple of parameters stored in a little work queue. So its, it's actual footprint is quite small because it's, it's just a pointer to a function, a list of parameters. And when that, these two futures become ready, the scheduler says, ah, this one's ready. And it just effectively, it's just like doing a function call into this lambda, which it then executes. As soon as that one completes, it then says that one, that future is now ready. So there's no... There's no context switch because you're not really using a thread. It's just a little. T it's just a function that's being run. Did I explain that? I mean, so the answer to your question is: if you if you used standard threads here, then the operating system is obliged, or the run, the standard library doesn't say. It, but if you say deferred, then it can it can do something similar. It can kind of queue those threads up, and that's why you saw that example that Peter showed. When he used deferred, it took four milliseconds. And when he used async, it took 300 milliseconds. Now, the async is saying, operating system, I want a genuine operating system thread. So if you did a recursive call into a tree, which was, let's say, eight deep with two to the power eight, you'd get 256 real operating system threads, which would be created. And that would really be a problem for your system, because they actually take up resources. And, then the context, and that's why it took 300 milliseconds. If you use the deferred standard call, then it's much cheaper. With HPX, it's another order of magnitude cheaper than that because it's just a function pointer, effectively. Mm, okay, so uh, for example, if you have a very simple algorithm like uh, this Fibonacci and uh, it's the fastest way to run is, for example, like sequential, then using HPX tracks should be almost like as fast as the sequential best uh, I, th I think if, if you had something as simple as Fibonacci, you would still be an order of magnitude slower than just sequential because Fibonacci is just, it's just basically adding one thing. And you've got the creation of a little task object. You've got to insert it into the thread queue. You've got to pull it off the thread queue. The scheduler has to do some work. So you would lose, you would turn a few you would turn an operation which takes a few clock cycles into one that takes a few hundreds or possibly even thousands of clock cycles. So you would lose quite a lot there. But compared to a standard thread, it would be much cheaper. So there's a sweet spot. And in fact, if you look at this, if you can fill gaps of a few hundred microseconds, if your threads are a few hundred microseconds long, then that overhead becomes a few percent, five percent max. If your, if your tasks are down into that, that little space between the blue and the green up there, if you start creating loads and loads of very, very tight threads, which are only a, you know, a few tens of microseconds or less, then the runtime is going to start to dominate. So there's a kind of sweet spot. You don't want to make your tasks too small, because then you're just breaking it up and you're putting too much of an overhead on the, on the runtime. Whereas if you make the tasks a bit bigger, then everything's lovely. If you make the tasks very big, then there's a different problem which kicks in, which is that you can effectively, if you, have, if, you, if you fill the queue up with lots and lots of tasks which take seconds to run, then there's, because there's no preemptive scheduling, I don't freeze you and run you and then unpause you and freeze you, and I don't switch you in and out. So if you have some critical thing, like, for example, the network, you've got messages coming in on the network, and you need to poll that many times a second to make sure that you don't have too high, too high a latency. If you put a whole bunch of threads which take seconds to run, tasks, I beg your pardon, which take seconds to run, and you fill up those, those queues, then you can create a problem because you can stop some other high priority stuff that you maybe wanted to run from running. So you need to be a little bit careful. And that's where custom executives come in because then you can say, right, I want tasks which do monitoring of external things over here going on on these threads, and I want things which are just general work on these threads, and I've got some high priority and low priority, and so the executors give you that flexibility. So if you can create all these tasks and just spawn them on the thread pools, that's lovely. But what would be even lovelier is if you could take the whole STL and just have parallel versions of it, and 
if you could combine the execution of those parallel algorithms on the same framework using the same, same thread pools, and if you could even return futures from some of these parallel algorithms. And so that's what HPX Parallel tries to do, is to implement the standard parallel experimental algorithms on the HPX thread pools. And you, when you create, gosh, we're already over time. Does everybody want to run away or shall I carry on? <laughs> when, you create, when you create your parallel algorithms, you basically have to say, how, where shall I execute them? And what additional parameters are required? Uh, so you can run an algorithm sequentially, or you can run it in parallel. You can run it in parallel and run it asynchronously and get back a future, or you can run it in parallel and sort of block and wait for the answer. You can say, I want to execute this algorithm on that node. I want to spread across all the nodes, the how, the where. You can have specific parameters to control how many threads you want for your parallel algorithm, or whether it, it's not part of it, the, the system at the moment, but you could imagine saying this is a high priority and this is a low priority task. And the sequence that you want things to be executed is the DAG that you've created by saying spawn this and then when that completes, do that. And also you need this as an input and wait for that to be ready and blah, blah, blah. So these parallel execution policies or properties are used as a policy tag on your parallel algorithms. And I've just said what these ones are. So you can have sequential, parallel, and parallel vector. Um, and HPX extends it with task versions of these so that you can run, let's say you want to do a, a parallel transform on this iterator. And rather than say, run it in parallel and then give me the answer, you can say, run it on parallel and give me back a future of the answer and I'll wait for that later when I actually need it. The executors look a bit like this. This is an example that I cut and pasted from one of my bits of code yesterday. And in this particular case, I'm using a parallel execution policy with a static chunk size because the lambda that I'm executing in here, this is, I'm calling, sorry, in this case, I'm calling a function called footprint. And this footprint is actually a very simple calculation. And so by saying HPX parallel static chunk size, best chunk size in here would be something like 10,000. So supposing I've got a million elements in my iterator, begin to end is a million long, I might want to say, don't break it up into three and run 300,000 threads. Break it up into 10,000 and run, I don't know, 1,000 threads. Because I know that it's a very cheap operation and I don't want to overload the system. So you can choose a chunk size. If you don't choose a chunk size and you say, instead of a static chunk size, just give me a dynamic chunk size, then when the parallel algorithm starts, it will actually execute a couple of iterations, time them, and it will say, ooh, that took three microseconds. Better run about 500 per batch, effectively, per, per task. And it will split your iterator range up into 500 size chunks or 5,000 size chunks, and it will do a little timing operation. But if you know how expensive your lambda is or your function that you're executing, then you can guide it. And ideally, in the future, there'll be, a, there'll be an HPX parallel and there'll be an auto-tune option so that you can allow the algorithm to run and after a number of iterations, it will have decided on a best chunk size, and it will remember that and use it in the future. And in this case, I'm using... Everybody familiar with zip, zip iterators? Because if, if you haven't used zip iterators, they're wonderful. It's when you've got an array that you want to iterate over, and so you want to do a for each on that array, but you also need another array which you want to kind of also iterate so that you iterate over this one and you iterate over that one. And you can do clever things with these fancy iterators. And there are transform iterators and permutation iterators and zip iterators. And you can create sequences from a counting iterator and a permutation iterator and then zip that up with a transform iterator. And then you can effectively generate sequences which you can pass into your functions. The thing you have to be careful of is when you pass begin and end, into your 
function here. Oh, I beg your pardon, this is a, this is a lambda. I, I missed the line there. I thought I was just calling this here. My lambda here is taking a footprint object, which is a little simple struct def defined earlier. And you have to be careful that the type of this tuple that gets passed into here is you can spend hours looking at error messages. Will asked yesterday about, you said, I'm not frightened of the templates, but I am frightened of the compiler errors. The, the errors that you can get if you get the type of this iterator wrong, it's just pages of nonsense. And I, I don't know how to tell you to learn this stuff because it's, it's really a problem. <laughs> you know, the, the compiler says the type of this doesn't match the type of that because the, induct because the instantiation of this says that it needs that. Why doesn't it just tell me I've put the wrong parameter in? Just say, look, you've used a reference instead of, of an instance or you should have used a pointer instead of a type. I, I, it's, it's, really, it's really painful. So when you use these, um, I was going to point out, yes, that those algorithms that we mentioned here, how do you actually implement a transform exclusive scan or a parallel fill using HPX itself as the runtime? And in fact, it's basically done using exactly the same. In this particular case, this is a recursive call inside a sort. So you've got a sort which says, right, I'm a very long array, I better split it into two, sort the left and sort the right, and then merge the two, and then recursively sort the left and right and merge those, and it recursively does that. And the one thing you want to make sure is that when you recursively spawn tasks that the user has given you, if he gives you an execution policy that says run it on these threads using this, you need to make sure that when you recursively spawn those tasks, you use the same execution policy. So you do this kind of thing, but the actual async call is exactly the same as the async call that you are using. So the library is implemented using its own threading, effectively. And it uses the same return at the bottom to say there's a data flow of the left and the right iterators which were spawned, the uh, left and right futures that were spawned from above. Um, this is, I think, almost the last slide. Just one of the slides that popped up yesterday, or this morning, I think some of Marrow's stuff, it was talking about policy based design. And something you'll see if you look inside the parallel algorithms is that the types, the types of the return. So if I do a parallel find using a sequential ex executor, it will just return an iterator. But if I do a parallel find using a task based sequential executor, it'll return a future of an iterator. And how does it do that? It's quite straightforward, but fiendishly it's fiendishly complicated in that you have an enable if, if you've got an, a valid execution policy like sequential or parallel or task-based, then use the result type of the execution policy, the type of that, as the return type of this algorithm. And this uses the Sphini deduction and also the... But that doesn't mean that when I call the algorithms, I need to use auto in the result type. If I don't know if it's going to be an iterator, I don't know if it's going to be a future. Is ah well, how, how do I how do I call an algorithm basically and get the if result? you if you if you call the algorithm and you say sequential, then you know it's going to return an int or it's going to return a, an iterator. And if you call the algorithm and you put parallel, parallel task, you know it's going to return a future of an int or a future of an iterator. And so you match those two, but you could just use auto. But the problem with using an auto there is that if it returns a future, yeah, you need, you need to, to wait get. on it at some yeah, point, yeah, exactly. so you, you should so. really know. But it gives you the option of effectively using all of those parallel algorithms, and so you can build this huge DAG that you've constructed by recursively subdividing your work, and you put all those futures together, and then you finally encapsulate that in one single future, which represents the final result. And then you can put that function inside another future, which you can just spawn off. And whilst that one's going, you can spawn off other ones. And so if that one doesn't scale very well on n cores, you can say, right, just use four cores, do all of that work. And meanwhile, you can spawn another one over here. And so you can fill, it's all to do with filling those gaps in your execution so that you don't have things that are blocking and waiting. Um, there's also a support for a fork join open MP type where you define a task block. I haven't actually used that, but I just present it just so that you know it exists. It effectively waits at the end 
although it's been extended with a future version so that you can, you can not wait, which is rather clever. And we're already out of time, so it's a very big library and it has quite a lot of features. And one of the cool things is the distributed async stuff, so that you can say everything you did before, like do this algorithm, and when it completes, do this. You can run that algorithm on a different node. So you can say, load all the, what you want to do is you want to think, instead of, instead of starting a program and putting MPI in it on every node, you want to think, what is, what is the problem? The problem is compute tomorrow's weather forecast. So you've got one task. Compute tomorrow's weather forecast. First task, load a whole bunch of data. Do that on that node over there and send me the piece I need. And when you're at it, send all the other nodes the pieces they need. Another task I need to do is initialize a whole bunch of state tables. So spawn that task. <coughs> Distribute that on a whole bunch of nodes. Another task I want to do, ah, oh, what is it? I need to also compute a whole bunch of lookup stuff. Do that. Each of your tasks can then be broken into subtasks. And you can run them on the node you're on, or you can spread them somewhere else on the network. But you have to stop thinking in the MPI world, unfortunately, because collectives don't really map very well. Because the thing is, if, if you're writing an MPI code, this node is doing a receive, and this node is doing a send, and they're kind of matched. When you're doing it in an RPC type of approach, you're a node over there, and I just send you some work. And you don't know I've sent you any work. You've just got work queues spinning, and they receive some work, and they say, great, and they just do it. And there's no explicit synchronization between the work that node is doing and the work this node is doing unless you actually tell somebody that I'm going to spawn this work on that node. And when that work finishes, tell somebody else on that node to do this and the other. So when you create your tasks, you have to be a bit more clever about how you do it in a distributed way. So you can't just take a simple MPI code and rewrite it. Because all of those MPI collective operations that were kind of implicit in the way you designed your algorithm, they're kind of not there anymore. So anyway, performance counters are marvelous because you can tell the runtime to print out all the time it's spent executing these tasks, all the time it's spent doing management of the tasks, all the time it's spent doing, you can effectively decorate each of those async calls with little numbers to tell you what's going on. And you can do other things like you can register a piece of memory with the runtime, and you can allow it to move around, and then you can say, do this function on that bit of data, even though you don't actually know which node the data is on. That's kind of experimental, and it's to do with, that's why I put the distributed in brackets, because the ability to spread your data across the nodes, and they say, well, I don't know who's got this, but compute something on it, and when it's finished, give me a result back. That will all be in place, hopefully, sometime soon. And things like custom executives and schedulers. I'm at the end, and we're at the end, so I stop there. I've got spare slides, but I'll stop. Questions? Well, what I like about HPX is the idea too of combining distributed computing and parallel computing in a single kind of single abstraction. So you do a remote uh, function call, and this is also something you do in uh, uh, distributed computing. So having these two words to come in the same place, if they are efficient enough for HPC, it's a good uh, standardization thing because they will cover a lot of users. So the success of this, I think, would be very uh, important. But yeah, there's, I think there's a lot of work to do for mm. that. Yeah, I would say that it's, it's not entirely production ready, but it's certainly very, very good for experimenting with different approaches. All right, then. Question. So, so you just said it yourself. It's uh, experimental. It's an intellectual, intellectual exercise programming HPX. So if we do things in HPX and it's in incorporated in C++ 17, then we're lucky. Then, then that's great, right? Then we just rewrite our, our algorithms in C++ 17. But if it's not, then we're stuffed. Is that, did I understand that right? If there was only a yes or no answer, then I suppose yes, you'd be stuffed. But we can predict the future of the project to at least n years ahead, because there are funding programs in place, which will keep it alive for at least three to five years. And then beyond that, you can remake the decision. 
Yeah, um, you... When I say that it's experimental, I think the distributed version is quite experimental. It works. You can do useful programs with it, but you might not get the performance you got with your MPI code. For on a single node, then I think, I, th I think if you gave me pretty much any program written with OpenMP, I could probably beat it with HPX, or at least match it. But so I would, I would say standardization is not the solution to all the problems. Actually, it might be even the other way around. But, uh, you know, uh, we, we lived with MPI for many years. It, it, was not, it was not standard at all. It was just a de facto standard, right? That, and it was working well. Everybody was using it. The vendors were implementing it. If, if, if HPX is successful, uh, someone would, uh, would do the work. So even, even, even if it's not standard. The challenge now that if you write an HPX application now, you would put your effort there, and maybe in a couple of years they say, oh, I'm sorry, didn't work, then you're stuffed. Not if it's not going into the C17, or actually C20 maybe, uh, but uh, it's not that the objective. The objective is that this thing stays around and can be used. But, but the, I mean, the, the standard, <coughs> the algorithms, the, the standard parallel algorithms, that, that's going to happen. They may not be as efficient as yeah, you true. might want them, the but they're going to go. I mean, it may not happen in C++17. Yeah, it true. might might take C++20 or whatever, but they will go in. So if, I mean, if you, if you think parallel in terms of, I want to do a parallel find and a parallel sort and a parallel scan and then a parallel... Um, <laughs> Uh, accumulate, and you think in terms of those parallel algorithms, and you write your code in that way, and you don't create threads manually, you just write everything from the point of view of a parallel. And I have a, I actually have an example which I was going to go through if I had time. Yeah, we have to close, people will have to get trains and things. But if you write your algorithm in terms of a sequence of parallel steps, which you can reduce to effectively like one line calls to parallel algorithms, then you'll always be, you'll always be fine because I'm tired now, but as I remember, um, <laughs> there are some other uh, approaches to build this stack and have a scheduler like, I think it was TBB or something like T that? TBB is marvelous. And if, if you're using TBB and it works, then carry on using it because so it's great. So this is the same so It same basically idea. does very, very similar to TBB. And the OpenMP tasks with dependencies? Open Without MP, yeah. Sorry, and then Open... OpenMP also has these tasks where you can define the... Yeah, but OpenMP is just rubbish, isn't it? I mean, okay. come on. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not so much that it's slow, it's just that you don't have the kind of composability that you... You, you can't express your algorithms in... You, if you, when you write OpenMP program, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm going to write it in serial, and I'm going to stick parallel loops everywhere. Yeah, and you're just adding pragmas. You're not really writing a parallel code. Yeah, and code. the main problem with OpenMP is not integrated in the language. So it will always be something outside. So you cannot integrate, for instance, you, can do, you cannot do a reduction with an arbitrary operator with OpenMP, which is crazy, <laughs> really and, crazy. And, and what Mauro showed us a few minutes ago with, for example, you can use a tag type to define the layout of your array in memory, and then you could pass that into the COCOS and it would operate on your data in a different memory layout. Oh, you can do that with the executors and with the schedulers in HBX. So you can say, okay, it doesn't do what I want, but I can supply a type traits for this type of executor and I can put it in and then I can customize it to do what I want. And that you couldn't do with OpenMP, which... Okay. Done. Should we go? <laughs> Thanks. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>